All right, we have Joe Schmid with us on today. He is a philosopher at Purdue University, already published at the gosh mature age of what are you, Joe? Twenty. Twenty. That's unbelievable. It's already <laughs> in the book out on Amazon. A philosopher, indeed. And Joe, give us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for having me on. Um, my name is Joe Schmid, and I study philosophy and biology at Purdue University. And I also basically just do three main things with, with my philosophy background. Number one, I do like actual sort of scholarly research and things like that. Uh, so like writing papers and, and having discussions with philosophers. Number two, I have my sort of active blog, uh, which is Majesty of Reason at word, or dot wordpress.com. And along with that, I have the, the book that I published, The Majesty of Reason, A Short Guide to Critical Thinking and Philosophy. And then I also have uh, my YouTube channel, Majesty of Reason. It's hmm. great. Okay, so I love that you call yourself an agnostic. It, it's pretty rare that we hear that. Usually it's either Christian or theist or atheist. But if you push a lot of atheists hard enough, they will say they're kind of agnostic. They just don't roll with that title often. So walk us through and walk us through kind of the audience's understanding of what agnosticism is. And before we kind of get there, Paul Simon had a very interesting quote on NPR not too long ago where he said, all of life is about questioning when it comes to God and spiritual realities. You are never to stop questioning. As a matter of fact, he says, when you do stop questioning, that is the end of you. So never settle. Always just ask questions and never come to kind of this solid conviction where you think you have an answer. How do you kind of define agnosticism and how do you think through it yourself? Yeah, so agnosticism, roughly I break it down into uh, three different kind of categories. So one of them is a suspension agnostic where they just completely suspend belief either way in whether or not God exists. So um, I should also specify that agnosticism is always agnosticism with respect to a particular domain. So, you know, you can be agnostic with respect to God's existence, or you can be an agnostic with respect to aliens or with respect to such and such. So uh, agnosticism, like I said, uh, I break it down into roughly three categories. One is a kind of suspension agnosticism where you completely suspend belief and you don't really even assign any like determinate probabilities to uh, God's existence or God's non-existence. A second kind of agnostic is what I call an epistemic agnostic, which is what I am. And so an epistemic agnostic does assign a determinate probability to whether or not God exists. And roughly, they say, after weighing the evidence and looking on it both sides, roughly it's about halfway, halfway probable each way. So about 0.5 probability as to whether or not God exists, given what they've looked at the evidence. And then the third category of agnosticism is what I call in-principle agnosticism, which briefly says um, it, no one can know in principle whether or not God exists. And so I, out of those three, I fall into the epistemic agnosticism one. So... Since our worldview is not based on proof, but faith, if are you able to numerically define when it comes to my faith, how much conviction I have? Like, am I a 75% kind of Christian, a 95% or do I only have 2% faith? Like, how are we not all agnostics? No, that, that's such an excellent question. So I really do think it, it uh, depends on the notion of probability that we're talking about and then also the individual that we're talking about. So the notion of probability is what I call, or not what I call, but what philosophers call epistemic probability. So it's essentially where you think the evidence uh, lies, essentially. And it doesn't have to be evidence in the sense of scientific evidence or even things that you can write proofs down. Uh, it could be personal experience. It could be, uh, you know, it could be a whole host of things. It could just be intuition, things like that. So it's really where your total body of information, as it were, where you assess how that body of information leads. And so that's the, the notion of probability at play. And secondly, it'll like I said, it'll depend on the individual, right? And so we all have different backgrounds and experiences and um, yeah, personal experiences, friendships, um, you know, this whole host of factors that go into forming how confident we are in things. And so um, I really think that uh, oftentimes it's difficult to give a kind of determinate probability assignment. 
And so, uh, and moreover, it's not only going to be determined by proof and like this kind of hardcore kind of evidence, evidential factors. It's also going to include personal experience and things like that. So I think faith fits in there as a kind of um, maybe a, a kind of non-explicit evidential factor. So like it would be something like personal experience or trust or something like that. And that can actually weigh into to your confidence. And so, um, yeah, that, that's roughly how I, would, how I would respond to to your question there. Do atheists have belief based off of evidence or do they just have fact and truth? Yeah, so this goes back to what I was talking about, the individual thing. So it'll depend on the atheist, right? Some atheists are very considered in their in their view, and they have this worked out worldview of reality. They have certain philosophical arguments for it. Maybe they bring in some kind of scientific evidence for it. Um, and so these are kind of like people, if you're thinking like uh, philosophers like Graham Oppie and uh, Felipe Leon and Stephen Meitzen and these sort of atheist philosophers or agnostic philosophers. By contrast, some other atheists don't have that kind of evidence, and maybe they um, maybe they just do it for personal reasons. Maybe they don't have any particular reasons. So I do think it'll really depend on the individual in question. And I don't think we could say anything about. I'm not sure which end froze here. How oh, atheism as such? It's a really person-based epistemology. Gotcha. Okay, that's helpful in many ways. So. I think a worldview, whether it's an atheist, agnostic, or Christian, comes down to highly cultural, can you live it out, emotional, does it fit with your emotions connected to identity, your psychology, and then your intellectual side of you, as well as your reasoning capacity. See, when it comes to God, I don't think simply because God brought me into this world as the son of a pastor that I necessarily have a much better chance or opportunity to have eternal salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, than say a boy in Madagascar who's never heard of God. Would you agree with that or disagree? No, yeah, I, I definitely think it would, um, your chance of salvation, I know I'll be quick, but I think your chance of salvation would probably likely, if, if God exists and he's perfect, I, it would probably go down to how you respond to the information that you've been given and the, the cards you've been dealt as it were. So I, I definitely think you would be in, um, you know, you'd be judged as it were, according to the dealt cards you've been dealt and the same with the Madagascar kid. Hey, Joe, I'm Cliff. Good to meet you, man. Nice to meet you as well. Uh, Joe, I am convinced that God loves you, that God loves all of us because God stepped into human history in the person of Jesus Christ and revealed that. And so when I want to get to know God, I examine Jesus through an historical study of the gospels. Now, the reason that I'm not an atheist is because I think it's more reasonable to believe that non-existence cannot produce existence. That's unacceptable for me rationally. The reason I believe there's a God is because I am convinced that chaos cannot produce order. The reason I'm not an atheist or even an agnostic is because I'm convinced that non-life cannot produce life. I'm convinced that matter cannot produce morals. I'm convinced that non-reason cannot produce reason. Because all of those are miracles if there is no God. And the problem with atheism and agnosticism is there's no God. There's no miracle worker. How do you respond to that line of thinking? Yeah, that's that's super interesting. So I think there's a lot to digest there because, um, you know, you, you gave a, a kind of different categories of things. So you're talking about non-existence and existence or non-life and life or non-reason and reason. So we can kind of think about this as how do we bridge different categories of reality? How do we go from one category to another category? Like how how could you bridge the category from non-existence to existence or from chaos to order or from non-life to life? So I think uh, casting it in terms of, of those categorical leaps, as it were, is a good way to get a, a handle on this intellectually. As for how I'd sort of respond to that, given that sort of preliminary, uh, I think that I would say that those aren't commitments of atheism as such, but rather commitments of a sort of maybe a reductive kind of materialism. So this is where it's really helpful to distinguish between um, one's view about material objects and one's view about matters and, and, and matter and morals and things like that from one's uh, ontological position as to whether or not there is this divine reality. And these things can come apart because not all atheists are going to be 
uh, you know, diehard reductive physicalist materialists where they, you know, accept sort of a moral nihilism and they deny the existence of consciousness or perhaps an irreducible aspect of human persons. So what I would say is that um, atheism as such does not require or entail that existence came from non-existence or that order came from chaos or that, you know, persons or consciousness came from non-persons or non-consciousness stuff. So that's what I would respond. I'd say that's not a commitment of atheism as such, but instead a kind of physicalism or materialism. All right. Interesting. I am convinced that you and I have no choice. We cannot be agnostic about the basic questions of life, like, does human life have value? Like, is there a purpose to life? Like, are there moral absolutes or is morality simply an opinion? Like, is there life after death? We're all going to have to go to funerals. We're all going to have to make some type of decision whether we think there's life after death or not, because we're all confronted by death on a real regular basis. The statistics on death are overwhelming. One out of one do die. So you're going to put your head on your pillow tonight. I'm going to put my head on my pillow tonight. And like it or not, I cannot say, well, I don't know. I'm agnostic about whether human life has value or not. Well, I don't know whether there's a purpose to life or not, because I have ambition. I have motivation as a person. And my ambition and my motivation tattle that I do believe something about reality, something about purpose. My ambitions, my motives show it. I would argue that I'm going to have to choose whether to be mean or kind, whether to cheat the IRS or to pay my taxes. So I can't be agnostic about ethics. I, I have Life forces me to make ethical decisions every day. And then I'm also going to have to decide, you know, is there evidence that there's life after death or not? And if so, why do I believe what I believe? So I don't quite understand what you mean when you say you're agnostic in light of the fact that you are forced by life practically to make decisions every day that are based on some type of answer to why is a human being valuable? What is the purpose of life? What's the basis of my ethical system, whatever that system is? And what about life after death? Why do I believe what I believe? So how do you explain that? No, that, that's such a good good question and valuable valuable points that you're bringing up. So what I would say is that recall how I defined agnosticism. It's always agnostic towards a particular domain, right? And so merely from the fact that I for, or someone else is agnostic towards the domain of whether or not God exists, that doesn't mean that they're agnostic towards all questions about ultimate reality. So for me, for instance, uh, I'm actually convinced by a lot of different arguments for moral realism. I think that moral realism is true. I think that there are objectively moral values. I think that uh, what Hitler did was objectively wrong and ought not to occur. And so um, what I would say is that uh, this agnosticism isn't like a full-blown agnosticism with respect to a bunch of aspects of your life. Uh, instead, it's with respect to a particular domain. And so uh, that actually allows me to navigate life uh, you know, perfectly well uh, for the most part, just because you know, I do have you know, a, a metaphysical story to, to tell as to how you know, persons are valuable and as to how moral realism is true and things like that. So that, that's one aspect of my response. And then the second aspect of my response is, uh, you know, you mentioned life after death. Now, uh, I, I think that um, how we live this life can reflect actually a kind of agnosticism with respect to what happens after death, right? So we can live our lives uh, in, a, in a way that, you know, if God exists, we respect um, we would respect that fact if God exists. And, you know, we can even be hopeful, hopeful theists, as it were. We can be agnostics, but hopeful theists. We can hope that God exists and live our lives in accordance with that hope in some sense, right? And so I think we can distinguish between these different doctastic attitudes of hope and belief and living your life, you know, uh, in as most valuable and kind way as possible, uh, just in case there ultimately ends up being a God. So I don't think it ends up um, paralyzing moral decisions or things like that. So you're really going to say, I'm going to live as if there is a God? No, so that, that, I, that I was sketching one way that a, an agnostic could go about answering that question. So someone could do that. But another thing is just because you're going to live the intrinsically morally valuable life because it is intrinsically valuable in and of itself, not how it is in relation to God or in relation to something extrinsic, right? Like we would think that torturing puppies, there's something wrong about that in and of itself, regardless of uh, its specification to facts outside of that, right? It's something in the very nature of puppies and something in the very nature of torture, something in the very nature of suffering that makes it wrong. Um, and that there's a categorical reason there. And so you're going to act in accordance with those categorical reasons and those intrinsic values. Um, and so that, that's probably what I would say. You're going to um, respect the, the moral facts that are there, right? And if there's a God to reward you for respecting them, or if there's not, it's still intrinsically valuable regardless of that. What is the object of reason that snapping puppies' necks is wrong, 
if there is no God who defines value? Yeah, so uh, I think it would go down to the the nature of suffering and the the badness of pain. So when I when I examine pain, when I'm in pain or when I'm in suffering, I can just see. You know, I can just immediately see. It's crystal clear to me that this is a a negative axiological state of affairs. So axio axiology that just has to do with value. So whether or not things have positive or negative value, whether they're good or bad, things like that. And I think that when I, I can just sort of examine my own mind and I can see, I can just see as, as, as crystal clearly as I can see that one plus one equals two, that pain or suffering is intrinsically bad. And so then we can, we can build various metaphysical accounts of this, like in virtue, uh, in virtue of what is it? Maybe, is there a realm of platonic abstracta that, that are we being moral Platonists? Are we going to be ethical naturalists? There are a bunch of different interesting metaphysical questions as to how you can parse that out. Um, but I think it would go down to the nature of pain. Now, one, one, another aspect of, of my response to that would be um, right, like God, when he's, when he's sort of creating or uh, commanding these sorts of things, like don't snap the neck of a puppy, God either has some reason to command that or not. If he has, if he has literally no reason to command that, well, then his commands are just as arbitrary as you, know, you and I saying to do it or not, right? They would be arbitrary if he has no reason. Whereas if he has a reason, then it's that reason that's giving us the, the reason not to snap the puppy's neck. And God's this sort of mediating factor. So I think that there's a kind of dilemma facing the divine command theory aspect to that. I just want to quickly go to, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about what is morality other than harm, to harm or not to harm? And I, I think there's so many different shades of that. I mean, think about when it came to cigarette use. Early on, it, it, we didn't think that there was any harm to it, did we not? But then slowly, we started to realize, oh, no, this is really taxing the healthcare system. There's got to be something wrong to it. So it's a, it's a moral issue. It's become a wrong. There is harm to it. Think about pornography, for example. A lot of people thought, no, if I look at pornography, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just two people having sex. They're enjoying themselves. They're having a hedonistic experience. So am I. But then if you dig a little deeper, typically those women are being abused, oftentimes sex trafficked. So I, I don't know if the harm principle when it comes to morality actually stacks up. I mean, you can look at it in another way as well when it comes to religious, for example. I think moral relativism we see lived out in our really individualistic, autonomous culture. I mean, you see in different ways. I, I think pro-choice is at an all-time low for a reason. When it comes to now we can look at the baby is actually being harmed and that's connected to something higher. We, we feel it morally in our consciences rather than just, oh, the baby's being harmed. Take it from a religious perspective or point of view as well. Think about how people will say, oh, no, all religions are great. Other than those that you have different forms of honor killings perhaps in, then that's not good. Who's to say that just because supposedly a child or somebody else in a family is harming somebody? No, no. Morally, there's some transcendent order that I think we would all agree on that makes that really wrong. Because in that tribe, in that village, in that even country, they would simply say, no, it's it, it's totally right because it's uplifting the group, the community. We're going to have favor in God's eyes now because we're doing away. We're, you know, really going about killing this individual for the for the larger group. I think we see this in other ways too. I think, you know, morality when it comes to defining it through happiness. Well, what if I were to say, this could be true, in Mozambique, there are 10,000 slaves. They say that they're happy. They say that perhaps they're even happier if we did a, a happiness quotient in some kind of way than the man on Wall Street. So what makes that wrong? So those are kind of the things that I struggle with when it comes to the harm and the happiness principle in relation to morality. Yeah, no, th those are really good points. And so I want to be clear that I wasn't sort of endorsing that harm is the single thing in virtue of which something is wrong and there's no other way that it could be wrong, right? I, I, we were talking about the example of, you know, snapping a, a puppy's neck or something like that. And so uh, harm can be one way in which something is wrong or in virtue of which something is wrong. Uh, but there are, are I want to leave open, of course, different ways in which something can be wrong. So uh, with so that, that I think that covers that point. Now, as for um, the kind of you use the word transcendent. Now, it would probably depend on how we precisify that kind of language. But I would, of course, agree that there is something that transcends these cultural boundaries in virtue of which we can say that right. the people having slaves in the African country are objectively doing something wrong. You have to have some something that uh, is across cultures. And I think that's going to be these necessary moral truths concerning, um, you know, <laughs> harming people and, uh, you know, different rights that people possess in virtue of their rational natures and so on. So, yeah, so I agree with you that there would have to be some cross-cultural standard there. Mm -hmm.
So we agree that there are some objective morals. We agree that there are some necessary morals. I guess where we disagree, Joe, is, is the harm principle a sufficient basis for saying that something is objectively right or objectively wrong? Because remember, who am I to say what harms Joe? Oh, of course, uh, on the superficial level, I can say it's wrong to take out a knife and stab Joe. But who on earth am I to say what really harms Joe? I don't know what really harms Joe when it comes to the more sophisticated, complex issues of life. So it becomes totally relative because you're going to have your definition of what harms you and harms me and what benefits you and what benefits me. And so you're still locked into moral relativism if there is no God who has created and defined human value, which means there are ethics because human beings are valuable. And if you denigrate them or hurt them, then that is evil and wrong. So I think you're still stuck in moral relativism if you say that the basis of morality is the harm principle. Who defines what harm is? Especially in light of how we're not just physical beings, we're also emotional beings. Am I really that knowledgeable of Joe that I can determine what hurts Joe or what benefits Joe emotionally, psychologically, physically? I mean, isn't that a form of incredible arrogance that I would assume that I could determine that for you? Okay, so yeah, those are those are good questions. Um, it's difficult because there were like a lot of different questions within that that were were thrown. <laughs> so so um, right. I, I do want to say uh, firstly that uh, I never claim that um, you know the harm principle is the sole basis of reality so, or of of moral truth. So I, I do want to clarify that because I do think that there are other ways, namely in terms of virtue or violating rights, acting in accordance with virtue, and so on. So um, so that that's one thing that I would want to clarify. The second thing that I would want to say is that it seems to me that you were kind of um, switching between the epistemic side of morality and the ontological side of morality there, right? So you were talking about like, who are you to say? Like, what justification do you have for imposing your conception of harm on someone else? And then you switched from that epistemic consideration to the ontological consideration as to whether or not there are such objective facts of the matter, uh, as to whether or not it's relative. And those are different distinct domains, right? The first one is an epistemic domain concerning your justification for making these, these different moral assessments. The second one was to the objective fact of the matter, regardless of whether or not we have justification for those facts. It's a kind of epistemic and ontological distinction. So um, what you kind of pointed out there was something along the lines of uh, moral disagreement. And I don't think moral disagreement threatens the objectivity of moral values. Um, and I, I, yeah, I, I guess I don't really see the, the force of that reasoning because there can still be these objective moral truths, even if we disagree with them. And there are various ways to go about solving that disagreement, right? We use our, we use our rational and scientific tools. We look at human nature um, because I think our, our nature is such that uh, we can glean things, glean truths from it that are objective truths about human nature as such. And those can help dictate our, you know, the rights that we assign and things like that. So um, long story short, I think there is a kind of conflation there between the epistemology and ontology. And I don't think that disagreement within epistemology uh, should commit us to um, there being no objective fact of the matter within the ontology. All right, then let me see if I can be even clearer. I used to speak every year in the fall on that green mall there at Purdue University. And I mean, those Purdue University students were some of the finest students I've ever met. But I would also speak at UC Berkeley and San Francisco State University and a few other schools on the East Coast. And those students were a tad bit more obnoxious. <laughs> I would argue that the fine Midwest, with its strong values, is basically living off the fumes of the ethics from the Judeo-Christian heritage. When you talk about human value, sir, if there is no God, there is no difference between an ant, a roach, a monkey, and you. So why do you and think that? Why, why do you think that? Because your view of reality is that all of matter, all of reality is matter and energy. See, no, that's materialism. That's not atheism. How can you be more than a materialist if there is no God? If there is more than material, but there is no divine being. So that's how. So um, you you know a bunch of a bunch of uh, naturalists and uh, atheists are what we call in philosophy of mind. They are dualists of some sort. So you have property dualists like uh, John Searle. You have um, I mean even people like David Chalmers and so on. So uh, you know there are a whole host of individuals who accept non-materialistic 
versions of reality who still don't say that there's this divine thing that stands beyond um, nature as such. So uh, I, I think that there are definitely ways that you can be a uh, consistent atheist, but also not be a full-blown sort of eliminative or reductive materialist. Okay. And from my 38 years of being on university campuses and listening to different philosophy professors speak, I am in strong disagreement. If you close the universe by saying there is no God, what you're saying is matter and energy are all there is to reality. That doesn't but follow. <laughs> there's no evidence. There's no evidence of a value of justice. There's no evidence of a value of love. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. So uh, let's, let's talk about what evidence is. So right. evidence well, is some sort of evidence is some some sort of consideration that tells in favor of a hypothesis or theory. Now, if we could get Bayesian, we could say that evidence is uh, some piece of data that uh, is more expected on the hypothesis than on that hypothesis of negation. And so we can actually make these uh, you know evidential assessments uh, without appeal to God or anything like that. Um, moreover, there's this thing called phenomenal conservatism. It's a view, it's actually kind of a popular view in epistemology. It says that it's seeming to be the case to some subject that P is true, provides some defeasible evidence for P's being true for that subject. Defeasible just means that uh, it gives you kind of prima facie reason absent defeaters or absent overriding reasons. And so if that's the case, if we accept that principle, as I do and a bunch of other epistemologists do, because I think that there are really good arguments for it. I mean, for instance, Michael Humer, his book, uh, Skepticism in the Veil of Perception and other books that he's written. Um, so if we accept that principle that it's seeming to be the case provides evidence for its being the case, well then, so long as it seems to one that uh, you know objective moral values exist and so on, then one actually does have evidence in favor of that. So it's not true to say, um, like we don't have any evidence of uh, moral values and things like that. Maybe we don't have scientific evidence, but of course. And, and maybe you're just a dream I'm having right now. It's possible, right? But the overwhelming evidence is, Joe, you are really Joe Schmidt, and I'm really Cliff Connectly, and we're having this discussion. So yes, anything is possible. I agree with you. But the question for a thinking human being is, what is most reasonable in the light of the evidence? Now, you've had the experience of moral outrage over evil. You've had the experience of the celebration of good and kindness and love. Now, that evidence points you to reality being bigger than matter and energy. There's got to be some type of intangible, non-material, non-physical value that demands a mind. And <laughs> matter has no ability to define or distinguish justice from injustice, right from wrong. You've got to have a mind. And if there is no God, there is no mind, which obviously means it's the human mind that creates justice and injustice, love and hate. It's just a human production, a human creation. You define it your way. Adolf Hitler defines it one way. Mother Teresa defines it another way. I define it another way. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. It's all relative. And yet your experience of reality is that's not true. Evil really is evil. Good mm -hmm. is really good. That's your experience. So your experience should drive you, I am convinced, to acknowledge that indeed there's got to be some type of God. And then when you look at heart of Jesus Christ, at the quality of his lifestyle, the way he treated people, when you look at the results of people following Christ, you see an incredible quality to life that you respect so much that you even like to say it's real. In fact, I kind of like to live that way. I think that's magnificent, don't you? Yeah, yeah. So I think there are, there are a number of things to say in response to that. So uh, for me, I'm not I'm neither a physicalist nor a materialist. So I think that there are certain non-reducible features of reality. Uh, one of which is, of course, morality. So I agree that there isn't just matter or energy. But where we disagree is whether or not that requires some sort of infinite mind. Well, then, I, 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 that that seemed to me to be a leap there, right? right. Like, why would that require? Your explanation. Give me your explanation. Of what? Of what? Why you believe that justice is a real value in spite of the fact that there is no God? It's a uh, well, what, so so yeah. one reason it derives from phenomenal conservatism, right? So I think that- What does that mean? So uh, as I was defining it earlier, phenomenal conservatism says that if it seems to one, so seeming is a kind of like intellectual appearance or you know, it just seems to you something to be, to be the case, right? So if it seems to, to someone that P is true for some proposition P, then that person has defeasible evidence for that P's being true. Joe, that's not reason, that's sentiment, that's emotion. No, no. So what we're yeah. talking about is what we're talking about seemings here, right? So it seems to me that it, it, it seems to me that I see like a computer in front of me, right? And you know, we have all we have all these different. It seems to me that one plus one equals two. Uh, so, so when when philosophers use the term seemings, they're not just talking about like feelings or emotions or things like that. 
Uh, so it's, it's way broader than that. So if we accept this principle of phenomenal conservatism, which you know, a number of epistemologists do, including myself, uh, then it's, if it seems to one that something is the case and you don't have overriding reason to doubt that it is the case, well, then you have evidence that it's the case. And so if it seems to me that justice is, a, is valuable and so on, then I have, I have defeasible evidence for that. And I don't think that the proposed defeaters that philosophers have leveled against that, like from moral anti-realist philosophers, from people who don't think that morals are, are real, right? I don't think that their arguments succeed. And hence, I don't have those overriding defeaters for my seeming. And hence, I'm justified in accepting that justice is valuable, say. Joe, I don't experience guilt because I have violated a principle, a sentiment. I experience guilt because I have violated a personal human being with dignity. I've demeaned them in some way. I receive forgiveness from a personal being. I don't receive forgiveness from a philosophical principle. I don't receive forgiveness from some rational theory. I'm a person. When I experience guilt, it's a result of having violated a person, and I need to ask that person for forgiveness. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that, I, I, that's, that's a really good point. And so I think that we're, we're, we have to distinguish between our interpersonal interactions with people involving the moral landscape versus how we're justified in believing that there is a moral landscape. So remember, I was just talking about our justification for believing that there is a moral landscape, which is distinct from and can overlap with our interpersonal communications. Now, if I could go on the offensive for a little bit here, um, I would like to, to ask you, like, um, when God is commanding these things, right? I mean, he either has a reason for commanding these things or not, right? If he doesn't have a reason, then it's simply arbitrary. There's no reason one way or another for commanding you not to snap uh, something's neck. Uh, so that's that horn of the dilemma. On the other hand, if God has a reason, well, then surely it's that reason that's doing the explanatory heavy lifting here. It's that reason that is counting in favor of not snapping that baby's or the, the, the dog's neck. So how do you escape this dilemma? You know something, uh, Joe? I got a great watch right here. When I say great, I mean it hammers nails incredibly well. That's irrational, Joe. Why? Because the purpose of this watch was not to hammer nails. The purpose of this watch is to tell time. Similarly, if there is no purpose for a human being, then you have no basis for saying what's good and evil, what's right and wrong. You got to understand purpose. So God, whose character is good throughout eternity, has created you and me for a purpose. That is why there's a good and evil. Evil is violating the purpose for which God created us. Good is fulfilling the purpose for which God created us. So when you begin to lock into the fact that there's an eternal God whose character is good, who has created us for a purpose, and that purpose is to love God and to love others, then all of a sudden you have a foundation for understanding why is something good, why is something evil. The good is that which fulfills the purpose for which we were created. The good is that which flows from the character of God, which is eternal. There's no principle of reason or principle of goodness before God. Why? Because God's eternal. So nothing or no one existed before God. And throughout eternity, God's character is good. He creates us, and we definitely are not eternal. We have a beginning. I have a birthday, so do you. God creates us for a purpose, and when we live out that purpose, that's good. When we violate that purpose, that's evil. And morality flows from the value of a human being who has been created for a purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, so I think, it, I think it helps, but to me, it seems to just push the question back a step, right? So you've kind of gone on discussing how God's creating us for a purpose, right? So let, let's, let's label that God's creating us for purpose P, okay? So God creates us for purpose P. There's still this fundamental dilemma that I don't think that you've answered, right? God either has a reason for creating us for that purpose, or he doesn't. If he has no reason, then it's simply arbitrary, and that's not going to be a, a sufficient source of morality. On the contrary, right, if he does have a reason for creating us for that purpose, well, then that reason is what's doing the explanatory heavy lifting here, as it were, when it comes to morality. It's that reason that's counting in favor of, for instance, uh, that which God created us for the purpose for, like not torturing people. It's that reason that's, that's doing the thing, not, not God's commanding. God is just serving as a kind of intermediary between that reason and us. And so I, I still don't think you've escaped this fundamental dilemma. Either he has no reason or he has a reason for creating us for that purpose. I think you've just pushed the dilemma back a step. There are reasons that I answer you the way I do. There are reasons that I question you the way I do. I have a free will. I don't have to make my points a certain way. I don't have to ask you questions the way I do. 
So yes, there are reasons for the way I behave. Similarly, yes, sir, there are reasons for the way God behaves. No question about it. Now, because God's character is good, because he's the all-knowing creator of the cosmos, his reasons are good. He is the creator. And because he's the creator, he has the right to create us for a purpose and then to give us a conscience so that we can understand good versus evil, justice versus injustice. Does that make any sense? Yeah, no, that definitely. So I, I agree that God can serve as the sort of mediator between these reasons and us. But once you take this side of the dilemma, well, now we've just accepted it's the reasons that are really counting in favor of the morality of the action or not. Right. It's it's not it's not God. Sure, God's good and he's he's creating on the basis of such reasons. But now we've agreed that it's the reasons. It's those reasons that are counting in favor of the action or not. Not God's just serving as a mediator here. And hence, I think you sort of um, you're in the same boat as me as we were earlier. Uh, now we have these kind of categorical reasons that are counting in favor of some action. God is simply the mediator between those reasons and us, and it's those reasons that are that are doing the explanatory heavy lifting when it comes to moral truths. Joe, the reason I started out with myself is I'm a person. There is no such thing as a rational power separate from a person. It doesn't exist. God is a personal being. That is why God reasons. Reason is not just some inanimate object out there somewhere or inanimate philosophical idea reason implies a mind that has a free will a robot doesn't reason a robot doesn't make decisions a robot does what it has been programmed to do god is a free personal being who has created us as free personal beings and we can reason so yes god has reasons for what god does same way you and i have reasons for what we do but no it's, it's not some sterile impersonal computer called the reason computer that decides all this. It's a personal being who actually loves you and loves me and created us as relational beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we make, we can make a distinction here between the power of reasoning versus reasons considered in the abstract, like how they count in favor of things, right? So the power of reasoning certainly depends on a mind, but it's not at all clear to me that a reason's counting in favor of something depends on a mind, right? Like we, there, these reasons can be, for instance, the very nature of torture or the very nature of puppies, say. Those things yeah. can give us categorical reasons. So I don't think reasons, uh, reasons, we can distinguish between reasons and the minds which consider those reasons. And so I think all you've shown here is that the power to consider reasons, that requires a mind. But the reasons themselves, it's a further question as to whether or not those uh, require a mind. And I think that the, the naturalist has perfectly fine and adequate ways to, to account for those reasons. They could be grounded in the very natures of the things in question, like puppies. They could be um, abstract objects, like necessarily true propositions. Those are counting in favor of certain actions. They could be a whole host of things. There are a bunch of different theories in metaethics. And uh, yeah, the metaethics literature, it's super vast. But so that, that's roughly what I'd say by way of response. So... Okay, let's let's bring us down a second here. When it comes to moral obligation versus perhaps moral feelings. So a lot of people who are atheists or agnostics would say we have moral feelings. You look at Dostoevsky, when Dostoevsky says that if there is no God, all is permissible, do what you want. That has everything to do with, okay, moral feelings, I do what I want with no God, what anything goes but if there is a god then not everything is permissible there is obligation so if i feel like i want to do something because it's good or bad then just go for it if there's obligation that goes against my feelings or my feelings go against it you're still obligated that's why i believe it pushes more so towards a transcendental transcendent order so i believe hindus are closer to morality the moral principle for example than atheists I think that makes more sense, too, when it comes to human rights and talking about ethics, for example, because a Hindu wants to get off the cycle of reincarnation and you do that by doing good things. And so eventually you get to this place of, OK, now I'm doing good things for a reason and it's connected to a god or one of the 30 million gods of theirs. But an atheist, there's no real purpose. I'm not saying you're an atheist, but maybe you 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 know, you're closer to an atheist, perhaps than a Hindu or a Christian. I don't know. You are have to flesh that one out for us, Joe. But how do you think through in terms of practical living? I mean, I mean, do you really think that we can reason our way to morality? Do you think our morality has simply come through the process of evolution, raised red and tooth and claw, and somehow we've come from apes, therefore let us love one another? I mean, how do you make that jump? Or do you come from 
again, perhaps just the culture or those who are in power, or is it just you personally, kind of the Sartre or Camus um, take on things? Like, how, how do you work through that? Yeah, no, so that, that's a really good question. So I did want to briefly say like, so yeah, as, as an agnostic, I was like 50-50. So I am as far away from atheism as I am from theism. Right. So I, I'm certainly not an atheist and I would not describe myself as an atheist in any manner, shape or form. So that's what the epistemic agnostic, it's as close to theism as it is to atheism. So, so that, that was just a, you know, for the audience. So the second thing that I would say is, um, Again, I think it depends on what domain of ethics that we're talking about. So we have meta-ethics, which asks about like, what is the nature of right and wrong? What is the nature of obligation? Do right and wrong exist? Uh, and in what manner do they exist? So that's kind of meta-ethics. That's this highest level. Then on the lower level, there's kind of normative ethics. So that's our ethical theory, uh, a theory of right and wrongdoing. So in virtue of what is an act right, in virtue of what is an act wrong? There are a bunch of different theories on that. There's consequentialism. So they say that only consequences matter in determining the rightness or wrongness of an action. There's virtue theory. They say that, no, it's, it's the character on which you act that determines whether it's right or wrong. Uh, and then there's deontology, which says that there are these certain inviolable rules or axioms, um, perhaps categorical reasons that count in favor of certain actions and, and say whether or not they are right or wrong. And so I think there's this a whole panoply of different ways that I could respond to that. Um, now, as someone who works in... Uh, like metaphysics and philosophy of religion, I haven't studied uh, normative ethics in, in too much detail. So I, I don't have a considered view on normative ethics. But if, you are, if I were pushed to have a considered view, I'd say I'm something like a mixture between a deontologist and a virtue ethicist. So I think that an act is right or wrong for everyone, regardless of culture or what, what have you, uh, in virtue of the, uh, the, the character that leads them to do it and in virtue of um, they're following and abiding by certain rules that are undergirded by categorical reasons, the reasons that I was talking about uh, earlier, like reasons in favor, counting in favor of something. And so again, how that, whether or not people consciously work that out, like um, is irrelevant to our moral theory of right and wrongdoing, right? Because, um, you know, we can have theories of things without, you know, consciously going through those theories every single time we make moral decisions. So uh, I think I'd distinguish between the sort of practical aspect and the theoretical aspect there. Okay, we're gonna move here, I, that was good. Let's move here to, and we'll find agreements, but also probably some disagreements on this one, but because we only have a few minutes left. When it comes to your worldview, how does it make the most sense of life? So let's get really pragmatic here. And because for me personally, the Christian worldview makes the most sense of life. And if you could share yours as well, because it gives me a stable sense of identity that doesn't change no matter whether I'm a dad, no matter what, whatever career I am in. It also gives me a meaning that suffering can't take away, no matter the situation. It also gives me an eternal hope. And everything in me, and I think probably everything in you, wants there to be eternity out there. Perhaps if you're more so prone to not liking people or a state of depression, like some people I know, they don't want there to be eternity. But then you ask them, well, do you want there to be some type of judgment, some type of justice at the end of the day? And they would say, absolutely. 10 out of 10 have said that to me. I, I haven't found one that said no, especially when we're living in a time where justice is talked about quite a bit, let's just say. Um, and, and then next, how does it make sense of your emotions? I mean, we all doubt ourselves. We all question ourselves. A lot of counselors will say, no, no, just focus on yourself. Give yourself a good word. Grow your confidence. No, we all know that we need an outside word to help us grow in our stable sense of self. And I believe those outside words are mercurial. There, many are you're going to have your parents say you're the best thing in this world, while others are going to say, no, you stink at this, that, and the other. You have a God who unconditionally loves you, whose son even died on the cross for you. That is a stable, stable voice that gives you a sense of self that nothing can change, no matter what. And then I think for me, I, th I think there's plenty of evidence based off of the historical resurrection as well. And I think metaphorically, we all have a sense of understanding that there's death and resurrection in this life. And I think we all want a type of resurrection metaphorically and then historically as well. And then when it comes to going to church, I mean, all the evidence behind why in the world are people so much healthier in these types of communities? And then in terms of it gets back to human rights. There's a reason to do human rights if you believe in God. If you are an atheist or agnostic, it becomes very challenging to make the leap from saying, this is my worldview, this is my premise, Therefore, let me go out and truly help people. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Yes, there are plenty of good atheists, good agnostics that are better than Christians, 
but the world as a worldview, it doesn't make sense to make that kind of leap. It takes a lot more faith that you can't prove in order to help those who are weak, those who are hurting. So there are many more, but those are a few of the reasons why I think the Christian worldview really fits. And I didn't even really touch on, you know, sacrifice, love, so many of these other, I mean, I mean again, why sacrifice for another person? It, you would be shocked how many times I've heard people say, sacrifice for another person, this gets at egoism as an ethic. Because it, it helps your, I mean, every good deed you do is simply puffing yourself up and helps you feel better. So go ahead and do it. How, how do you make sense of your worldview? How does it practically, in the nitty gritty areas of life, make sense of this life for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And it's actually something I, I haven't thought about too much because as a, you know, as like philosophers, they're always thinking about the theoretical and the abstract side of it. So I, I haven't thought too much about um, the sort of more practical aspects of it, the emotional aspects of it, you know, um, just these sort of practical everyday kind of things that you were talking about and the emotional aspects to it. So I haven't quite thought of that too much. Uh, and so I'm just ruminating uh, or, I, you know, I'm thinking, uh, thinking over it and um, trying to find uh, what I should uh, say in response. So what I would say is that I think um, my worldview, as it were, um, provides sufficient amount of resources to be able to navigate uh, reality in, in a reasonably effective manner. Oh man, am I frozen? <laughs> hey, you're good now. You're okay now. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> man, well, okay, I guess I should say I wasn't frozen. It was my, it was my screen. It was, this, yeah. it was this illusion that was frozen. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, okay, so I was talking about um, the sort of practical aspects of it. So yeah, I do think that my worldview, as it were, um, provides sufficient resources to be navigating these practical aspects to it. And I do think it actually goes down to being a moral realist. And this is one of the, one of one strong reason actually to be a moral realist, uh, regardless of your other sort of metaphysical positions, namely that it's one of the only ways that you can really navigate reality. And it's hard to it's hard not to practically contradict yourself when you're a uh, a moral anti-realist. Like um, you know, all, a lot of your actions and sentiments towards other people are going to be. Uh, so contradicting, as it were, your uh, theoretical aspects of your moral realism. So that's one reason. That's not the, that's not the reason why I'm a moral realist. But uh, that's one reason counting in favor of moral realism. So I think once you have moral realism on board, you get a lot of the things that you were talking about for free. Um, not for free. Like, you, you know what I'm saying. Like, you can you have probabilistic and other resources to account for those other practical aspects of your life. So once you have moral realism, you can have um, a notion of objective uh, value to life in certain pursuits and objective disvalue to others, like torturing people, things like that. Uh, you also have um, the sort of moral oughts and, and you know, moral uh, considerations that, that lead you in your practical life. So I think that I think what I would say primarily in response is just uh, to say, I think what helps me with that is adopting moral realism. Um, and I think as I was talking about, the meta ethical literature is just vast and there are tons of different moral uh, theories and the, the normative literature is mass as, vast as well. So I think there are a lot of uh, both meta ethical and normative theories of morality that are perfectly uh, available to naturalists and me. So I, I was kind of sketching mine earlier. I think that there are these categorical reasons that count in favor of certain things uh, and so on and so forth. So I do think that it does provide uh, a sufficient practical guide. Um, yeah, so that's my main response. And just one other that I, I would include there, because again, I don't, I can't see the full jump because I agree with you in terms of, yes, you can get the ethics, but again, it takes a way bigger leap in connecting the obligation piece and why I should help this person who like, it's like the movie crash, someone who is dying in a burning car. Why in the world would, would I disadvantage myself to truly help that person? And I think from a Anything other than a theistic perspective, it ultimately doesn't really make much sense. And that connects to Jesus Christ, ultimately. I mean, once you have God, then you have to decide, okay, what, whether it's a major religion or any worldview, do you have to ultimately choose? And I think you get into the evidence of Jesus Christ, his character, his claims, and then his corpse having risen from the dead, that changes everything. But like you said, the purpose of a watch, what is the ultimate purpose? it gets back to also value as well. That's one we didn't touch on. I mean, how is a human life truly valuable? There's a reason why being created in the image of God changed the Roman empire when Christianity came up with that understanding in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. There's a reason why Jesus Christ dying on the cross for his enemies even changed the Roman empire because now you have slaves, you have women, you have children all of a sudden have value and dignity and rights. I think from every other worldview, Again, it's not that you can't find ways to say human beings somehow have value, but instead it's a pretty, it's a much bigger 
leap in getting there. Yeah, so I think that I think those are valuable points. So I guess I, I have to say that I have like signed kind of the opposite intuition. I think uh, adding adding God would actually make it more difficult. And why is that? Well, because I think that if humans have value, if these things are genuinely valuable, they are intrinsically valuable. By intrinsic value, we mean it's valuable in and of itself. It's part of the very nature or constitution of the thing to be valuable. It, there's something about uh, you know me, myself, or there's something about you that makes you valuable. There's something about you, not in your relation to something else extrinsic to you, but there's something intrinsic to you about your nature, uh, which is that in virtue of which you are valuable and so on. And so when we say like, oh, well, without God, well, you wouldn't have value. Well, no, now you're just extrinsicalizing the value. And that seems implausible to me. No, there's something in virtue of which you are valuable and it's intrinsic to you. It's not extrinsic by means of its relation to God's commands or something that God sort of imposes on you. Um, so I think that actually extrinsicalizing it makes it much more difficult to to give an adequate kind of ground because like I said, like most people, or at least me, I, I can speak personally, I have this intuition that whether or not something is valuable, is uh, it's an intrinsic feature of it. It's something, it's in and of itself, it's valuable, right? And if that's the case, well then it, it you know, pointing to some sort of extrinsic thing that's completely apart from it, right? Uh, or even if it has like, even if it created it or so on, or has purposes for it, um, that's going to be an extrinsic factor. It's not going to be an intrinsic factor. So we're all in the same boat together. We have to pinpoint something intrinsic to the nature of a thing, which is that in virtue of which it is valuable or that in virtue of which harming it is wrong. And that's going to be there on any worldview because we all have that intrinsic, the intrinsic nature of the thing. The question is that we're discussing here is whether or not there's this extrinsic creator or something and so on, right? So I actually think that it makes it more difficult if you introduce this kind of extrinsic element because morality is all about the intrinsic in and of itself. Uh, things about their natures of things. So yeah, that, that would be my main response. I guess I just have a tough time with that though, because when it comes to, I mean, who defines what's ultimately valuable though? Because you're talking about an intrinsic worth and value. I mean, my aunt is, she taxes the healthcare system in a way that I don't because she's handicapped. I, I mean, you know, you could say that Down syndrome babies are, are down 30%. Is that a very good thing? Well, yes, in many ways, because I mean, who wants to have a Down syndrome baby? Or, or no, it's a very bad thing because every single human being has innate rights and value and purpose. Or you could say, you know, the Aryan race. I mean, I mean the Aryan race perhaps is, is the pure, most beautiful race that could get most done if, if they're the smartest race. And so we should kill 6 million Jews. That, that would make the most sense. So, I, I mean, how does a humanist or an agnostic or atheist, I mean, how much does the circle shrink or extend in defining who is ultimately valuable especially those who somehow are handicapped or are weak in some kind of way. It, it's, it becomes almost impossible to ultimately define. You have to have some type of transcendent reference point to say that all humans have rights, values, and should be worth fighting for. I think Peter Singer, I loved his honesty recently in saying, you know, up to 28 days, even after a baby is born, they have less value and worth than a pig who is full grown. I mean, so again, there's so many different ways to to define this purpose and value. That's what makes it tricky for me. Yeah, no, it's a very valuable point. And this is what um, uh, philosophers who are kind of working on the, the intersection of ethics and the peer disagreement literature, uh, really what they're kind of grapple with. And I, I actually think it pinpoints to one of the kind of conflations that I was mentioning earlier on between epistemology and ontology, right? So in the epistemology side of things, there is moral disagreement. Yes, um, people disagree about you know the moral truths and things like that. But the mere fact that there's disagreement in the epistemological domain doesn't automatically entail that there isn't a fact of the matter in the objective metaphysical domain, as it were, right? And so I think that there are a lot of satisfactory ways to go about navigating um, peer disagreement in the peer disagreement literature and the uh, moral disagreement literature that don't threaten the objectivity of moral values. Because again, that's that's the epistemic sphere, whereas the objectivity of moral values, that's the ontological sphere. So there, there are two different, two different questions. Now, uh, as for how we'd go about that, uh, there are two. There are two quick things that I'd, I'd probably say. First of all, it, it would probably depend on our uh, normative theory. So the reason Peter Singer does that is because he has a normative theory that I think is bonkers. Um, he he is a consequentialist utilitarian, and the fact that he is committed to that I think is just a reductio of his consequential utilitarianism. I think we should adopt a different normative theory. So that's why I was talking about those kind of categorical reasons and those uh, the virtues and the virtue theory, right? Which predates any religion. It goes back to the to the ancient philosophers. This virtue theory. Um, because everyone can recognize that these virtues are sort of intrinsic features of us and, and, and so on. So 
that's one thing that I'd say. And then the second thing I'd say is, again, I don't see how God is uh, helping with this kind of peer disagreement, right? I mean, like, um, again, God, it goes back to that fundamental dilemma, right? When God is commanding that we do this thing, when God is commanding that we don't gas the Jews, which is, which is a good command, obviously, but when God is commanding that, he either has a reason for commanding it or he doesn't. If he, if he has no reason for commanding it, then it's simply just arbitrary, and that's not a good grounding for morality. And if he has a reason, well, then it's, that reason is what's doing the, the moral explanatory heavy lifting. It's that reason that's counting in favor of not torturing or not gassing Jews, right? And so um, now the, the atheist also has that those categorical reasons as well that count in favor of the action. God is just this mediator between those reasons and us, and he's the one who's commanding it. So that's my roughly, that's my rough response. I know I'll, I'll be quiet now because I was going on a long, I was going on a long while, so. No, no, that, that, that was still great. I just, I still though have a tough time with, I, I see where you're going with the reason piece. And if, if we fall on God's character, and the book of Exodus talks about how Moses, he lays out God's character beautifully, saying that God does not want anybody to perish, that God walks with us, literally walks with us, which basically means perfect relationship, that he wants perfect relationship with us. He is too the hundreds, if not thousands of generations ahead. He's with them, again, wanting everyone to be saved. I mean, the beautiful character of God, leave those categories aside. I think he's always operating out of that character. And that's the beauty of it. And he has clearly set conscience in the heart of Joe, as well as Cliff, as well as Stuart. And that conscience says to us, it screams to us that every single human being is worth fighting for in order to ultimately help flourish. Because otherwise, I, I really, I, I can't see any other way. Because I see way too much in terms of those who are saying, I mean, even, even just look, for example, just at, at the local high school or middle school level. Clearly, kids are saying, based off of in-groups, this kid is worthy. He's part of the popular group. This kid is part of the group that should be bullied. Or you take it to, you know, the ultra level of back to Nazi Germany. I mean, what could have stopped the Nazis? Should they have gotten together a nice little coalition of people to talk about, okay, what is ethical? What is not ethical? Are we making a mistake here? And would that have helped really avoid the gassing of 6 million and so many others having died as well? No, I, I think... I think ultimately, yes, sometimes issues can be certainly solved by a coalition that, that creates a type of ethics that treats people more valuable. But at the end of the day, I, I think you have to have a transcendent, moral God who is all good, all loving, who created outside of space and time, shown through his son that he died for his enemies, for all people groups. That creates a type of love for all people and no one's on the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I uh, know I'll just give a really brief, brief response. Um, yeah, we'll close. Yeah, go ahead. Take last word. Okay. Yeah. So um, no, I, I definitely just want to uh, thank you for those, those valuable insights. So uh, the main response that I would say is again, to kind of go back to that dilemma, like when God is commanding these things, he either has that reason or not. And it's that categorical reason that's counting in favor of it. Now, whether or not we can latch onto that reason, right? That's a separate, that's a, that's a question of epistemology, but the question of ontology is whether or not there is a reason. And that categorical reasons, you know, the we can have that on my worldview or your worldview as well. There's there's this categorical reason in favor of that. God is simply serving as this mediator between that reason and us. And so I do think that it would probably fundamentally go down to that that dilemma. I think that would probably be my my response. But um, I know we can probably table it there. So definitely. Do you want the final couple of thoughts? No, it's okay. Thanks. Good. It's good discussion. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate you. How you think? Keep searching. And we all obviously have doubts. We all have ways to, gosh, be better seekers of the truth. I think we all worship as well, whether it's worshiping God or worshiping the search. Joe, I don't think you worship the search. I think you actually are trying to find something to latch on to. Ultimately, I think you will find convictions. And perhaps, though, agnosticism is a, is a conviction. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a determinate probability assignment. Like, so for each argument, I think yeah. that there are some good arguments for God's existence, some good arguments against God's existence. So I definitely have lots of convictions uh, on those as well. And so, what yeah. decide one day? What do you think? What will I decide one day? I don't know. We'll see where the majesty of reason leads me. And, and so I, I do just want to say thank you guys so much. Like, what you guys are doing is so valuable. Like, just getting people to think about these fundamental features of reality and the ultimate nature of reality, it's so valuable. And so I want to thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for this, for having me on and for doing what you guys do. So thank you.
Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. Joe. Good to so meet you. It. Thanks yeah. for joining us. If you guys are new, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Hit that bell. We've got more debates coming out next week. And Joe, keep at it, man. Stay safe there at the university. Thank you. All righty. Take care.